Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today taking your questions on moving to a bigger shop, vehicle hesitations, replacing control arms, and more. This is episode 248 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. If you want to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Put question for Charles in the subject. Ask that question right up at the top. Hey Charles, I want to know this. Hit the enter button a couple times then give me the details of the question. Guys, that helps out so much, so much when you do that for me, it makes it way easier to help you out. And remember, there are audio-only versions of these, as well as many other shows that I do, available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, and of course, over at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And real quick, if you guys like the show and you want to help support it, more importantly, score yourself some awesome discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, Scanner Danner, Kerma TDI, Eurowise, USP Motorsports, and a whole bunch more. Check out that crew membership program. As always, links to all that and everything we talk about today are down in the description. And one final thing, there are timestamps of each question down in the description. You can click right on the time, it'll jump you right to that question. So if you wanna skip my rambling about something, slide down, click the time, and it'll take you right there. All right, that's wrapped up. Hit the questions. First one up is from Alex. I have a Seat Leon 2.0 TSI, which is the EA888 first gen engine. Had an intake manifold issue, so I had the flaps blanked off. Now since then, in cold start, it's running rough, and when you drive, it jerks badly as you drive in first, second, and third gear. When the car warms up and is driven, it's less but still has a hesitation. Am I right to think that there could be a vacuum leak? I've done spark plugs and coil. Don't know if you've ever come across this, but any help would be great. Thanks, dude. Okay, Alex, um, first of all, I really think if you're eliminating those flaps, you have got to have the engine, or should say the ECM, the engine tuned. You have to have the ECM tuned. Otherwise, the ECM is looking for those tumble flaps. Those flaps that are shut during cold start, during low RPM, and open under heavy acceleration are designed to help the air tumble in a different pattern than when they're open. So if you don't have it in there, that air's not tumbling in like it's expected to, it can throw off the whole deal. Also, those little separators that are installed in the cylinder head, I have seen cars perform very badly without those in there. And I've seen some that were okay, at least okay in the situation that I was evaluating them in without them. But really guys, understand that when a manufacturer does something, let's take these intake manifold flaps because it's a perfect example. I think we can all agree that overall, those flaps have kind of been a disaster. Thousands and thousands of intake manifolds replaced, multiple times even, over intake manifold flap issues despite the fact that they may not have been the best overall design or there's a lot of weak links, whatever it is, they're designed and they're there for a reason. Tumbling air properly, changing the way air comes up and into the cylinder rather than just flowing straight in. And if we upset that design, even if we're improving it, right? Let's say removing those flaps was an improvement overall, we need to tell the computer, which is thinking, hey, this one criteria, this one thing is supposed to be happening, and I don't see that it is, so I'm gonna do something to compensate. More fuel, less fuel, higher idle, lower idle, whatever it is, right? It really all depends. Uh, when it does that, we may see a drivability concern. So there's a couple of ways we can approach this. We can get a new intake manifold with the proper working flaps, put it on, and see what happens. Option. We can get our ECM tuned so that it doesn't think that it needs those flaps and maybe is compensating for that change in airflow differently. Another option. We can also, and what I would do first, is go back and double check our workmanship. Even not tightening the clamp that goes to the throttle body on that engine properly can cause drivability concerns. If you've tightened that clamp and instead of the clamp and the boots sitting flush, maybe the boots off a little bit, causing a vacuum leak and a boost leak all possible. Maybe the clip for the purge valve isn't in all the way. Maybe some of the bolts aren't all the way tight. Maybe a clamp's loose. Whenever we do a job on our car and we take it on that QC test drive and we experience something different that we didn't expect, right? We would expect that 
if we replace a wheel bearing, the noise is going to be gone. But we don't expect when we put an intake manifold on our car or something like that to have a drivability concern. Step one, always, no matter what, forever, is going to be go back and check your workmanship. Every bolt that you put a tool on, every component you put your hands on, go back and check that. Don't just look at it. Maybe get that T30 back out and go, yep, yep, tight. oh crap, this bolt's loose. Let me torque it down and get it on properly. That is going to be, for the most part, the way you find almost all the problems. Now, could be something totally unrelated. In this case, we made a modification that maybe the vehicle just doesn't like. But guys, step one always, when you do this kind of thing and you run into a problem, go back and double check your work because most of the time you're gonna find that you just miss something. This stuff happens. Happens to DIYers, happens to professionals, happens to the best in the business, right? Sometimes you miss something. So we go back and we recheck our work and odds are you're gonna find that you either miss something or in this case, the modification that was made, the car just doesn't like it and we need to put it back to stock or whatever we need to do to get it back right. So yes, very likely could be a vacuum leak slash boost leak. Go back and check your work and hopefully it's something easy and then you can really truly evaluate whether that modification to the intake flaps was a good one or whether we just need to get a new manifold on it. All right, next one up is from Luke. I would like to know how to replace lower control arms of a Mark V Jetta 2.5. Seems easy, but the only snag I see is removing the bolt, what I believe to be the passenger side. The oil pan seems to be in the way. I've heard to loosen the subframe bolts or to loosen the motor mount and hoist up the engine slightly to make the clearance for that bolt. I wonder what's the best way to go about this? Thanks, Luke. All right, Luke, good question. You can do that either way you describe. You can take the six bolts out of the subframe or loosen the six bolts out of the subframe and let it sink down a little bit, or you can take the two bolts out of the engine mount and crank it up and raise the engine. Either way works absolutely fine. I've always done it by loosening the subframe because almost all of them that I've done, other than a few exceptions, have been on a lift. So I'm not gonna lower the car down and sling the engine and go to all that trouble when I can just go zip, 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 and lower it down and then put it back together. A couple of benefits to doing the engine mount. If you do the engine mount, you're only loosening two bolts and then raising the engine. So that's only two bolts you have to replace. I would also take the bolts out of the pendulum mount too. That's gonna to give you a little bit more movement in the engine and it's gonna allow you to lift it up a little bit higher. To me, this way makes a lot of sense when you're working on it on the ground. Now, I would probably still loosen the subframe and lower it down because that's my process for doing this job. That does not mean it's going to be in any better way. In fact, if I'm loosening the subframe bolts, I'm not only responsible for replacing more bolts because those are also torqued to yield, now I have to make 100% sure that when I push that subframe back up, I line the bolts up with the witness marks from where they came. And that's the big thing that I think as a DIYer you would wanna think about. If I don't line that up perfectly, now my sh subframe is shifted a little bit, my alignment very well could be off. Now, if your control arm bushings are that bad anyway, getting an alignment's a really good idea, but you may not need that, and loosening the subframe bolts may re then require you to get that alignment. So either way works absolutely fine. It's gonna be kind of whatever's easier for you. To me, doing it on jack stands, it may be easier just to zip those two uh, engine mount bolts out and lift the whole thing up you know, three inches, two inches or so to get that clearance on a lift in a shop, it's gonna be pretty much easier to drop the subframe down so you're not going up and down with the lift. Either way, totally cool. Wouldn't stress about it too much. They're both gonna work just fine. Make sure when you're putting them back together, you're using new bolts, you're torquing them properly, and that's pretty much it. It's a super simple job. You know, if, if you didn't have to raise the engine up, let's say you're just doing the driver's side, especially on a manual transmission, it's what, three nuts and three bolts, something like that, four bolts, uh, super easy, but I'm pretty sure all of that hardware is recommended replacement when you're doing this job. So, dude, don't sweat it, it works perfectly either way, super easy. Also a super common failure is control arm bushings, either the front bushing squeaks or the rear bushing and the front control arm just 
rots away and, and ends up cracking and failing. You can find out the squeak for sure by taking those three 16 millimeter nuts off of the ball joint and just moving the control arm up and down and you'll hear it go squeak, 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 squeak. That is a much better interpretation of it than what it actually sounds like. Just kidding, that was terrible, but you get what I'm saying. So good luck, man, I hope that works out. And you know what, when you do the job, come back and post in the comments which way you did it. Or if any of you guys have a way you prefer, drop that down in the comments and let us know. For me, I would probably just loosen the subframe again because that is just my process for doing this job. That doesn't make it any better, especially working on jack stands. All right, next one up is from Donato, and it's a small shop versus big shop question. And Donato, I'm gonna be very honest, when I read your email the first time, I changed your name to Donatello and pictured you as a Ninja Turtle while reading this thing. I do not mean any disrespect by, by that. Uh, in fact, I enjoyed reading it more thinking that the question came from a Ninja Turtle. So I'm sorry, but uh, I just had to share that because I'm like crying inside. I'm laughing so hard about that. Uh, it says, hey Charles, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time and I've been working at my dad's transmission shop since 2009. I'm going to be starting a new job at Firestone on Monday. I'm taking the entry-level position, changing oil and tires just to get my foot in the door. In addition, I started going to tech school a year and a half ago. Do you think it'll be a huge adjustment going from a small shop to a big shop? Okay, it is going to be an adjustment for you. How big of an adjustment? I don't really know. There's a couple of things when I read things like this that I immediately think might, and I don't want to plant a seed, that is going to cause this to be a problem for you, but I wanna just make sure I mention it. A lot of times shops like this run very differently than say a transmission shop that's family owned. These go from, I need to get this transmission done for this car to a production style facility. How many cars can we crank in and out, right? And that to me would probably be the biggest adjustment. There's going to be a little bit different environment that you're gonna be working in, meaning there's probably gonna be some you know, office politics that you may have to tend to. The great thing slash bad thing, depending on which side you're on, is all that crap goes away if you're good, right? If you're a hard worker and you work well, then the shop politics don't matter, then the need to produce cars really, really fast doesn't matter because you carry weight. I'm doing this as fast as I can. If I do it any faster, I run the risk of making a mistake. Those are some of the verbiages I would use. You're also probably gonna find that things like paperwork are gonna be very, very different. An expectation from a customer might be very, very different. The type of jobs you're gonna be doing are gonna be different. Now, you said transmission shop, that could be we're R&R &R transmission, we're rebuild transmission, we're clutch, we're driveline stuff, right? Uh, prop shafts and differentials and things like that. Transmission shop to me means more than literally just the transmission. So a lot of these jobs you might be familiar with. Ultimately, guys, this is how I feel, period. Ultimately, it doesn't matter so much whether it's a big shop, a small shop, a dealership, an independent shop. It's how that individual shop is ran. You could have the most dirty, hole-in-the-wall shop with no special tools that's ran amazingly and is a great place to work and does brilliant work fixing cars. Flip side, you could have that big dealership with 35 stalls in it, every special tool on the planet, you know, white walls, clean as a whistle, and it could be a terrible place to work, terrible place to take your car. So much of it depends on how the shop is ran and then, even within that, it depends on your interaction with how that shop works, right? What is your North Star? Are you a very positive, I'm gonna do this job type of person? Or are you a, I don't wanna do this because it's hard, right, wine type of person? That also flips the dynamic. So I would go in, just like it sounds like you are. This is a stepping stone to get my foot in the door. I don't wanna change oil only all day, every day for the rest of my life. Use this as a learning experience. Use it as a learning experience to work in a corporation, which your dad's transmission shop probably isn't. Use it to learn how to work well with management, upper management, corporate, right? I think I said corporate twice because, well, I have feelings about that that I'll save for another time. And coworkers and customers. Your clientele could be totally, totally different. This is going to be a big change for you. It is going to be an adjustment for you. 
but I don't think it's gonna be that big of a deal because ultimately it boils down to, are you fixing cars correctly? And that's it. That's the whole thing. When you're doing that well, a lot of the other crap goes out the window. Yes, there's gonna be problems, but focus on taking care of your customers, focusing on fixing cars, focusing on doing what's right for the car and the customer, meaning if they come in and the tie rods are blown off and the timing belt's about to break and the tires are bald, um, maybe you can wait on the brakes because they still have some pad life left, right? Prioritizing these jobs for our customers is something that we should be doing a better job of, yet oftentimes we don't. Your pay plan is probably also going to change as well. I don't know if places like Firestone run flat rate or not. Um, I would want to know. I'd want to know that before I went into it. So maybe there's some questions that, that you'll ask. And if you're watching this the day it comes out, I'm guessing this is going to be your first day. So congrats on your first day, man. Positive attitude. Be the hard worker. Be the go-to guy. That was always my goal anyway. And uh, typically all the rest of that crap works out just fine. Or if it doesn't, you can always quit and go work somewhere else. All right, last one of the day is from DeAndre. It's about a VW DSG. I have a question for you on a 2010 CC. How long does it take to replace the clutch and flywheel? I was told seven hours, but I want to know, are they overestimating to get more money or does it really take the full seven hours? Also, do I need any new fluids, circlips, or programming after the change? Okay, um, so you said DSG, but you said clutch and flywheel. Flywheel, I get. The DSG also has a dual mass flywheel. On the clutch, is my question to you is going to be, do you mean the clutch, like it has a third pedal, or are you talking about the clutch packs? That's gonna be two very, very different repairs. Now, I looked up the labor time on a 2010 CC. Simply to r and the transmission is more than seven hours, so I don't think they're taking advantage of you. Guys, whether or not it actually takes seven hours, in many cases, does not matter. This is the pro and the con of flat rate for everyone, right? It works similar to, to the way it works for technicians as it does customers. If the repair manual put out by the factory or put out by the industry says, this job should take 10 hours, and a technician does it in 10 hours, cool. If a technician does it in six hours, they hustled or they bought tools or they know the, the tricks, right, to do the job faster. Technician wins. If it takes longer, the technician loses. From a customer standpoint, this is to level and kind of even out your quotes. At shop A, 10 hours. At shop B, should be about 10 hours. Now, if you add in the clutches, it's actually a little bit more, more like 12 hours, and that's reasonable. Uh, I would make sure, though, the shop you're taking it to is actually equipped to do the DSG basic settings. Some scan tools will do it. A lot of them won't, so that really depends. But, um, man, if they're going to do a flywheel for you for seven hours, yeah, I'd, I'd take that. You really don't need any fluids if you're doing just the flywheel. If you're doing the clutch pack, you will need fluid. In fact, that would be a great time to do a DSG service anyway. Um, and then they're going to do the clutch adaptations along with it. But if you're just straight doing the flywheel, you don't really need any fluid. That being said, I'd probably still want to check the fluid. You're probably going to need some coolant because you'll be taking the coolant lines off the... Uh, off the transmission cooler. They may want to put new circlips into the axles where the axles snap into the transmissions. That'll really depend on the uh, on the shop. The repair manual also calls for dropping the subframe. So going back to our, our early question, I think our second question, now we have bolts we're going to add on to it. We're going to have an alignment probably that we're going to add on to it. So just because it's seven hours R&R, &R, transmission out, transmission in, doesn't mean that there's not going to be more on top of it. I would say if they're saying seven hours and that quote is, I don't know, 700 bucks in labor, that's pretty darn good because if you brought it to me, I'd probably charge you more for it than, uh, than seven hours, even at a shop. I'm going to use that time, that, that labor time, the labor guide as just that, a guide. And I'm going to kind of start there. In fact, it pays almost seven hours to do this job under warranty. Typically, shops will use that warranty time and then multiply it by a factor. So we might use one and a half times warranty time or 1.35 times warranty time, it depends. And then within that, we can massage the time if we don't think it's gonna take that long, like the vacuum pump, where if you run full labor time, it's like 10 and a half hours, but we cut it down to four because we can get it done way faster than that. 
and it's not super fair to uh, to do it one way and charge a customer full retail when it's like almost three times what the time actually is. The flip side, we may add time to say a car that's super oxidized, they call that severe service, or maybe you have a bunch of aftermarket components blocking up that, that transmission. That probably wouldn't happen, but just as an example, you have, I don't know, a, a crazy intake pipe that wraps around the transmission for some crazy reason. Uh, we may add time on for that. So, dude, seven hours, flywheel, I wouldn't question it. That's about normal clutch time, transmission time, r and &R. If they get it done faster, who cares? If they get it done slower, well, they that costs them, and as long as it's not getting it done slower to charge you more money, it's fine, and that's, again, one of the reasons we have these guides to go off of, so that shop A isn't saying 15 hours, shop B isn't saying 20 hours, when the time should be about 10. All right, guys, gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, drop them down below. You like the video or the audio, hit that thumbs up button. Always appreciate that. Don't forget to subscribe right here on YouTube or over on the blog at humblemechanic.com. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Heroes in a Half Shell. Turtle Power.